told you he's witty, erudite. And that, I didn't know, you didn't tell me about that iPhone in your inside pocket. It's always there, it's always there. So when I met the governor, I didn't have a business card. And um, uh, I was then wondering how to keep up the contacts. I wrote a letter to the governor's office. And uh, it reminded me uh, when I was in Doha recently, and a very serious minister was asking me, well, where's your card? And I said, no, I don't have one. And he said, oh? I said, well, at least you're going to remember me now. <laughs> that was a fantastic, wide-ranging, really interactive presentation. I'm sure everyone's got a lot of burning questions in the audience. And I thought we might start, are you good if I take three at a time? Does that work? And one thing I was remiss about is not to introduce the lady who was sitting on my left to whom the governor uh, uh, referred to as his DG, Deputy Governor Sheila Mbijwe. It's a pleasure to have you here today as well. Thank you. So, can I, uh, can I look around the room? Has anyone got a burning question? Uh, so, Governor, first of all, I'd like to say congratulations uh, for a few things. Um, you know, you've, uh, you've, you've taken some tough decisions, uh, and I know you've been, uh, people have been critical. I, I think, I, I first of all, commend you for one of the decisions of not running against Joshua, because uh, he came to me and said that, you know, the, the governor has challenged him to run, uh, and if he had to walk, it would be fine. And the next weekend, he came to see me at my home, uh, and I said, what have you been doing? He says, I ran. I did a 15K run um, in a remarkable time. So I think you were smart not to run against him. And congratulations very much because you can't trust him. Um, congratulations for uh, the Africa Banker of the Year. Um, I want to take you back to the beginning of your, your, your talk um, around the outlook for the economy. Because whilst you said that we did well with 5.6%, I think the World Bank's view was that that was uh, a little bit unimpressive compared to our peer group. Uh, and the second thing you said was that uh, you felt that 6% would be easily achievable. But again, I refer you back to the World Bank, which said that um, you know, the, the shocks that, uh, that the Kenyan economy has faced over, over the years has been driven by two things. One is natural disasters, and the second is about elections. And as we've seen you know, quite a lot of polarization a year before the election, do you still feel confident that uh, the elections next year, which is more than a year away, the elections next year is not going to have a negative impact on growth. My name is Ali Hussein. Um, I'm an investor in a number of fintech uh, um, companies in Nairobi. I want to take the governor to a statement he made uh, to sort of start my question to him is let's wait for the more advanced economies to advance on the blockchain side. Um, my concern with that, sir, is that first, we all know, uh, and I stand corrected, but we all know that regulation usually follows innovation. Um, sort of innovation is always in front, but do we want to give up the advantage we have in this region? Kenya is now sort of ground zero for innovation. Uh, we are literally on the bleeding edge when it comes to these areas. Some of us in this space, especially in the startup space, would love to engage more with the central bank. We would love to have conversations regarding how we can make this space a lot more um, reasonable and safer. Uh, but I would love to disagree with you, sir, that we cannot wait. People are moving forward. Bob will tell you, if we waited, we would probably not have Mpesa today if we waited for regulation to sort of move forward. And I'm humbly asking that the central bank opens discussions and forums with the tech space. Um, reminds me um, many years ago of how, and I'm not saying this is what you should do, but maybe this is something that we need to look at. Reminds me of what Jack Welch 
developed it when he was running General Electric, certain areas that he wasn't sure about, and he decided to do some reverse mentoring, where he got young people attached to senior executives within General Electric to understand the tech space a lot more. We know what then happened. So, humble request, uh, not really a question, just open forums to engage with, uh, you never know, we may have another M-Pesa in our hands very soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, a very, very good speech. And uh, first of all, I just noticed your socks, Bob. I'm sorry, but they're really beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> they have all sorts of colors. Uh, my name is Martina Kabel. I'm from, <laughs> from True North Leadership. And um, I have so many questions that I'm thinking maybe I should become a flight attendant and meet you there. Um, now, uh, I also used to be a customer in Imperial Bank. Um, I think I have told them several times over a number of years that something was going on and I just regret that I didn't listen to myself and left because definitely the education of the staff was not adequate to, to deal with what was going on behind the scenes and at a higher level. So, uh, so that was uh, one, of, one of my thoughts around that. But what I think is maybe more important is that um, we have spent a lot of time and years, and I think, uh, Josh, you probably are part of that as well, that in, in, um, in talking about a savings culture and, uh, and helping people to, uh, to trust banks and not trust their mattresses. So I see that, that one of the big dangers, as you also talked about, is that we might uh, get back to mattress uh, banking instead of banking in the banks. And uh, a lot of SACOs have uh, ma huge deposits. So, uh, and those are all uh, very much small uh, people or people with a low income, and they just can't afford to lose all their savings. So. Do you have uh, an army of uh, people who are dealing with the psychology around this? It's the psychology of, of the economy in the country and the psychology that will still help us uh, trust the banks. And of course, we need to know that it is trustworthy. And I think you stand for this trustworthiness, definitely, because you're so tough. And uh, do, you, do you sit down and have the discussions that you talked about, not the umbrella discussions, but the other ones with uh, Josh and with others uh, in the banking sector so you ensure that, that we, don't, uh, we don't change that drive towards a mindset that we actually can save money, we can trust our financial system? Because I think without that, uh, we will go backwards. Thank you. So taking them sequentially, the, the first question was, about, was Bob's question about the prospect, I mean the, the numbers do. On the one hand, the World Bank thinks that we could have done better on the 5.6, but we should, the 6% for 15, 2016 is uh, too rosy, blah, blah, blah. Uh, two things, one is we don't always agree. Uh, and uh, I think we'll be the first one to ac admit that uh, you know, at times we do have differences of views with uh, other, other actors. But I think I would agree with the 5.6 in the sense that it is, compared to others around the world, it's pretty good. That's clear. This global growth was much lower. There's no doubt about that. But remember, it was still below our potential. So we still had room to, we still had a lot of headroom. So growth could have been even faster. So from that perspective, yes, we agree that uh, 5.6 is not, uh, you know, doesn't represent our best effort in this regard. But at the same time, I think the most important point for us is not the number. I mean, there's a sort of a, yeah, in the jargon here, we, we've talked about tyranny of numbers in a different context. But I think we need to appreciate that at times the number is not what is important, it's the direction. And you know, there's a now discussion about whether it's really GDP is the correct measure and this. Yeah, we've had, we've seen those sort of discussions. 
So the issue here is that the economy is doing better. It's doing better than was expected by some earlier in the year, uh, precisely for the same reasons that you mentioned, that the World Bank is concerned about the future. You know, we'll always have weather-related issues. We'll always have elections. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's something, it's, it's part of the landscape. Uh, that's, the, that's the situation we, we live in. But I think what is different is that, uh, in terms of now looking forward, what is clear to me is, what is clear to us is that external shocks are not that important. That is, I think, something we need to be clear about. And those will be there, but uh, they are not as important. Whether, yes, we are rain-fed agriculture and so forth, um, and then also, by the way, our brothers in the southern part of, the, of Africa are suffering a really la the worst drought of, of uh, I think, in recorded history. Um, that can happen here, we, despite the rain. Or we could get too much rain. Uh, so those are things we cannot control. But at least those are what we call known unknowns, um, or somebody could call them that. Elections, on the other hand, they are there. Uh, a year some forward, but in terms of an in, being an investor, in terms of uh, you know the f prospects after the elections, um, my sense is that any one of them, any one of the people that are involved in this election campaign, they do not have a different economic model for after the election. So in a sense, they are more or less in the same region, if you understand what I mean by that, in, in terms of economic policy. So there is in the sense that the economic policy will be dramatically different, as opposed to say, if you think of uh, what may happen in, in uh, uh, economic or social policy, you could think, for instance, the, U, the US. That's where the, I think the outcome is much more, you know, we, we can go in all sorts of ways, you know. Um, so it could be, so I think the point is we have to understand that and actually if the World Bank asks that, you ask them well, what about the US, what do you think about that um, and see what the answer is. So we know what the buttons to push to get them angry. Um, uh, Ali's question about, uh, well it wasn't a question, it was a plea, um, uh, engage, 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 let's not wait, uh, all those things. I want to again emphasize that uh, even as you say regulation follows innovation, actually I disagree. Innovation is not a finished product. And this is the part I want to be absolutely clear. It's not a finished, when they came with the, uh, with the Mpesa, it wasn't a finished product. There was a sort of interaction. So yes, we need to engage, that's the point you make. But don't think of it as a finished product, that uh, this is how it is. Um, and I think that engagement also has to be taken in the context of the risks that are there. What is the greatest, if I asked you Ali, what is the greatest risk you think I have in terms of payments? It's not about cost. This new, this new, no, no, this new widget, whatever you want to call it, blockchain, um, the, the real advantage of it will be the, minim, the reduction of cost of transfers and things like that and assurance, right? We already have some assurance we can do better. I think we agree on that. Um, the cost may be smaller. There's a little detail about it being more in the private domain and all that, but I have no problem with that. I mean, PESA is very much in private. What is the real cost? What is the, if I challenge you on that, what would you say my real concern would be? KYC and, okay, you, you deal with it. Okay, let me not put you too much on the back foot, but uh, no, the, the point for us is a, is a little different one. All you need is that this transaction, remember what happened to Bitcoin in the US? No, 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 you do remember what happened there. Exactly, exactly, so you, exactly. I knew that's what you're gonna say. So very small portion, everything was good, but you had, you know, all we need in Kenya is one transaction, one transaction that is illicit. And guess what? Our correspondent banking will go south. Ask any of the SE, uh, CEOs. Look at what happened to Somalia. Look at what happened to Belize. I'll give you a whole list of countries that are pleading about the de-risking. That is the biggest concern today. It's not, no, let's not get into exchange. We can discuss it later. But I want you to understand that it's not that we haven't seen it. 
uh, and this is why we say, let's be moderate. Let's pace ourselves. This is a marathon. We don't win, frankly, we don't have any, it doesn't matter to us that we have a medal that we were the first ones to do X or Mpesa or any of these things. That's not what matters to us. What matters to us is we're able to put in place a, 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 a widget or a system or whatever, and our population are benefiting from that. That's what is most important to us. So let's be clear about what matters and what doesn't matter. Everything else, in my view, is fluff. Whether we are the first or second or third, um, in a sense, it doesn't matter. Uh, what is most important is that we protect our depositors. We protect our population. We protect the financial system. So if indeed there is a, an element of a little hole that, is come, that may come in, it's a risk. We need to deal with that. We could exchange some more, but I think I wanted you to be very clear that it's not that we don't understand what's going on. As I said, we are in touch with, the, with our peers around the world. Uh, but I think the issue here is the risks that we run and whether they are worth taking that risk today. If you ask any of the Imperial Bank uh, depositors, what matters to them? What matters to them isn't that uh, X is happening or Y is happening, it's their deposits. That's what they're interested in. And, uh, or ask anybody, tomorrow you transfer money some other way. Uh, and uh, if you, for whatever reason, get the, it will only be a few of us that will be involved in this at the beginning. But the cost, as I said, the social cost, the potential social costs are huge. And that's why we need to be moderate and, uh, and go out with it. If we go into the desert without enough, uh, let's say, resources, we know what will happen. Uh, and we cannot sort of change our tack halfway. You know, that's not the point. Again, moderation and this is something that applies in many ways, and sort of discussing it in a sort of a, you know, in a sort of a consistent way, and then we'll see what happens. If others get there before us, fine. Uh, if others don't, fine. Um, then the issue of uh, Imperial Bank, maybe it wasn't exactly Imperial Bank, but it was the issue of uh, the psychology, trust, and all that. That is essential. The number one, the only asset that really matters for our business is trust. Just that, trust. I mean, after all, that's why it's called, that's fiat money, you know? I mean, the only reason you take a piece of paper and give it, and you know that you can use it to transfer good and all this, is that there's trust in it. Um, and we all know there are currencies that nobody wants to use for bec precisely because of that. So we have a very strong, let's say, high sort of uh, premium on trust. So I think to you, to your point, uh, we've been working with the, with the CEOs to also restore this trust in the financial system. So going back to your question of you know, getting the money out of the matrices and things like that. And I think it's there. I think people maybe were, were a bit surprised, but uh, I think that came back. And, and, and an important element there was actually the reopening of Chase. I mean, when it reopened, actually, there was a lot of confidence that came back in the system. I mean, in using the system, like I say, you know, you have even in that particular bank, you have people putting in, opening accounts, putting in their deposits and things like that. So I think the point is there, but we cannot take it for granted. Uh, trust is won, and trust is something that can be, can vanish in an instant. So it's something that we need to work on to develop. So your point is well taken. Um, hi, how are you? My name is Jorge Mutahi and I'm a banker at City. Um, I would like to know the governor's opinion on the proposed East African monetary integration um, and the monetary union that there has previously been a lot of talk about, but I sense a slowdown in that discussion. And um, basically, yeah, your thoughts in regards to the East African monetary union and whether we should proceed with it, whether it's something that we should put away for now, and yeah, just generally your views on that. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can you find me a lady from there somewhere? Because I'm very conscious about gender balance. Someone was tweeting me, telling me I've had all male panels. Thank you, Sheila. You came and saved me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should say that um, the, your, your panel here is a panel of runners, and she's the better runner. Is so, she? Yes, yeah. I, I've, I've Be seen. careful. Yeah. My name is Wedira. 
Yes. And uh, I'm going to move a little bit from Bitcoins and interest rates. Uh, my question is a bit personal. Uh, creating this new normal, you have maybe stepped on some people's toes and ruffled a few feathers. I want to know where you get your resilience from. Yeah. This is this, okay. Your resilience. So I'm Victor Mutua. I'm a student at USIU and I'm very, very fan of um, fintech in Africa. So right now, as you look in the market, or rather the African market, you find uh, Nigeria is a totally e-commerce market where e-commerce thrives. Kenya is a fintech market, and South Africa is kind of confused, right? So I'm thinking about the future, where we are trying to build the next bank for the next generation. And I want to ask more about uh, the next frontier of banking, where digital banks are the thing right now, but regulation does not really allow that to go through. So I want to know if we have applications for digital banking, solid digital banking as a backbone uh, from CBK to our uh, certification. Because in the UK right now we have two banks, that's Atom and, um, uh, Atom and another bank where, which is fully digital and I really want to know if we already have, we already have uh, applications to the CBK. Oh, okay. East African Monetary Union, that is progressing. Uh, I think we remember in 2014, I believe, a year and a half ago, the heads of states signed a protocol um, that will, in effect, instructing or with the aspiration for a monetary union by 2024. So that is what was, uh, that's the timeline that was envisaged then. Now, in order to do it, again, things won't happen just by a flip of a, co of a switch. So there are certain things that need to be put in place. And there are some three, three bills that are being developed that will underpin this process. The first one is on the East African Monetary Institute, which will actually, that will have oversight in this process. There's also other bills on uh, um, transfers and things like that, which also, so all three bills are being processed, meaning they're being negotiated, and then they'll be passed in parliaments and so forth, and then we will execute on that. Basically, these are background things that need to be put in place. What I have to assure you is that this is a process that is, needs to be done deliberately. There's no rush to, you know, like a finish line, if we do it in two years or whatever, it's even better. I mean, we need to be very conscious of what we have. And uh, even as we go towards that sort of aspiration goal of a monetary union. Um, again, this is an interesting one because you remember, you obviously everybody in the room remembers that we were a monetary union years ago. Well, I say that in jest because most of us don't remember that. Uh, we used to be the East African there used to be the East African Currency Board, um, and it fell apart, uh, and eventually, 50 years ago, we had separate currencies, all three jurisdictions then. So, anyway, in a sense, the, there is potential. The one thing that I would also tell you is there are many challenges. It's not a simple flip of a switch. Um, and one of the things, we have a lot of experience from the Europeans that also had an aspiration of uh, putting, uh, I mean, having a common currency area, but uh, the economics were pushing them away, and there were things they did correctly and other things they did poorly. Um, I think we have seen Greece, we've seen the other southern countries, the sort of periphery countries in Europe, and the struggles that they've gone through. So there are things there. We, we, we need to do the right thing, which is to put together the knowledge from, uh, um, from all sorts of places, even as we go towards the currency union. Uh, the personal question, resilience. It had to I don't come. know. I, I'm actually not that resilient, I have to tell you. I, I feel kind of crappy at times, you know, um, <laughs> and grumpy. Um, well, I think the, I mean, this is a difficult question, but I think I'll just, put out things, maybe not in the best way, but uh, I mean, I really believe in what I do. There's no doubt about that. I'm an economist by training. I love being an economist. I, we can discuss economics until, you know, for hours. I mean, those are the concerns about economics are things that, I, that are mine. 
Um, and uh, so that professional, uh, professional perspective is very clear to me. But even as we say that, it means that uh, I'm, I'm also very, I, um, I want to study the matter. I don't like sort of a, a knee-jerk reaction to things, you know, cookie cutter sort of things. Uh, as an aside, um, there are those that have accused me of being an IMF employee. <laughs> Uh, and I would say, you know what, I was an IMF employee, so that has, you know, that blunts the challenge, you know, um, right there. But I mean, even as I was an IMF employee, I, I was still the same person. I question things, um, and I want to understand what underlies issues. And, uh, but I, I am not an IMF employee now, I, I just to put that on record. But, they, I mean, I'm like everyone else, out of the system, just you could be uh, like any other, you could have been employed by anyone else. So the idea of uh, looking at things, studying them, uh, being diligent about study on things, in some sense I drive the, some of this, my colleagues crazy because I do not want an answer that just says, yeah, it looks like this, no, 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 prove to me. Uh, you know, like the thing, you know, this is now going back after the journalist, you know, the reduction in uh, interest rates, 1%, you know, by 1%, 100 basis points. You see, this is actually interesting. If you're a banker, you never say 1%. It's 100 basis points, okay? So just, if you throw that in the right way, you sound like you're, you really understand what's going on. So 100 basis points. And they had interviewed all these people, and some of them said, nobody had said 100 basis points. There are people that said 50 basis points, and um, others know. Question is, why 50, why zero, why increase? That's the, what is most interesting. What is the impact of 100? What's the impact of 50? I mean, what are you trying to do? It's not just flipping a coin. Um, if any of you challenged me to flipping a coin, please, you will lose. I mean, bring a fair coin, and I can assure you, you'll still lose, you know? Uh, let's leave that. So, but the other thing is also, I mean, you, it's not just, a, it's the humanity side of things. You know, you have to see things as they are, meaning people are people. Um, so what is priority for you? Uh, what's priority for me? Um, I, as I said, I care about people, and not because I just, no, I just, uh, yeah, they're people, and I'm very clear about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, so there, there are all those considerations, and, uh, but I cannot, I don't, I haven't yet written my memoirs, by the way, and I'll, I'll never write my memoirs because I have no idea what I'll write, you know. Uh, life is too, is, is too short to, to kind of always write things, you know, but uh, <laughs> um, there was the issue about uh, in banks that may be coming in. Uh, by the way, that's why I like Twitter, you know. You can say everything you want in 140 characters, you know, that's uh, so in any event. So on technology, you asked uh, what's the direction there. At this point, I don't know of any sort of bank that is heavy internationally on uh, uh, virtual currencies. Um, by the way, I differ with a lot of you techies on what digital currencies are. Um, maybe you should read from our perspective as economists. Digital currency is not virtual currency. Um, anyway, I can challenge you a little more, but let's leave that for later. The point for me is, uh, no, we are not there. Um, so we don't have any institution that is trying to come in with this sort of uh, bent, because we have a lot of homework to do. There's a lot of sort of low-hanging fruit at this point. And uh, I can even just throw something at you, which is the Shalia compliant uh, sort of uh, banking. I mean, that is yesterday, it's, it should be here. Um, but it's still being developed in all sorts of ways. And you know, there's a whole swath of our population that uh, are interested in these products. And, uh, and you know, for whatever reason. And, uh, and I think in that sense, they're, they're those, sort of, those sort of things need to be developed. So um, the answer is no, but uh, the answer is in terms of innovation, I think we could say that uh, this the Central Bank of Kenya is the most innovative, innovative regulator um, that maybe you've come across, and even better than Bank of England in terms of regulation. Just to prove that point, I gave a speech in uh, Paris on May 2nd, May 3rd. 
And uh, you know, there were 38 countries represented that gave the keynote address. And uh, at the end of it, actually the French authorities, the French treasury authorities, um, asked us to provide them with technical assistance. Wow. I'm serious, technical assistance <laughs> in the area of digital currencies. What's that? And also the DG is going to the Fed. Next week, actually tonight, you're leaving, to talk about this, mobile money. So again, and we can go on like this. So even though we are not sort of saying, yeah, we are waving the flag here or not, you know, it's not about that. So I think is where you need to be a bit more, maybe let's have that conversation with the regulator and appreciate that he may have concerns that you don't have, understandably, because you don't, that's not your business to have those concerns. But I think it is important for us to, um, to, to be sensitive to those concerns. Oh, Joshua will be running with me. Joshua's got a... <laughs> thank you, Patrick. Yeah. Mine is just a pretty question on, just referring to, and first, thank you for a very exciting presentation. Oh, thank you. And a survey that was done, you're speaking to many young people here. A survey was done last year talking about young people still saying, it's so, so a very good survey, that they don't mind you know, doing the wrong thing as long as the end justifies the means. So the issue of corruption is an issue of ethics. It's about standing firm. So the challenges we see in the industry, part of it reflects difficulties in the generation, even the younger ones. So what could be your insights? And I know you and DG have spoken very strongly. What could you share to the younger people today because the whole issue about ethics and corruption isn't just about leaders and CEOs, about shareholders. It's about the younger generation as well. I mean, if half of us want to make sure we look the other way around, we're as much part of the problem as much of part of the solution. I thought you could share your insights, Governor, on that issue. Thank you. And just before Nickel speaks, he, he, uh, I noticed that you dedicated your award as a central banker to the youth of Africa. So I, there's been a lot of interest. <laughs> And, and if I can just add to that point, is that um, I think you really are playing a leadership role for the youth in Africa. I think, you know, and I'm not exaggerating by saying from the moment you stepped in, the way you didn't take the Muthaiga house, all those things that you did were really very powerful signals. Um, my daughter over there, who's 10, disagrees with you. She said she would have liked the house and the driver. But, <laughs> <laughs> but Nikhil. <laughs> uh, thank you, Governor Nikhil Hira from Deloitte. Uh, thank you for a lovely presentation, by the way, standing up here. I'm not challenging you, and I'm not accepting a challenge to any marathon, half or full. Um, I was, I'd be very interested in your thoughts about where the East, Af East African community is going. It seems to me with what's happening recently, we've lost the pipeline, potentially we've lost the railway. Uh, President Magafuli is doing a lot to institute discipline in Tanzania, whether it's working or not, it's still is out and maybe we're not doing as much, but it seems to me as though our community is now starting to break up again. And, and I'm wondering whether your, your views on that and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing for, for the region. Maybe begin with uh, Nicholas last, the question. Uh, I have to tell you that I'm just a central banker, so what I've, whatever I'm gonna say is just my own view, unfiltered, uh, and uh, I actually don't see it as a breakup. Maybe see it as an opportunity. It's true, we as Kenyans always expected that the pipeline will come through whatever, our neighborhood kind of thing. And, uh, and then decisions were made some other way. I see it as an opportunity uh, for us to think deep and hard, what is it that differentiates us? And what is it that we bring to the table? Um, it goes back to, a, well, I was thinking about Josh's question and uh, I gave a, I met a bunch of uh, entrepreneurs at the boot camp in uh, Naivasha. So it was great, you know, young people, you know, just talking about things. Uh, the only time in my life I've been invited to a sunrise yoga, you know, to do yoga in the, before the sun, it was like, uh, 
Ah, I don't want that. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way they were thinking, you know. Um, but in any event, I'll come back to that question. But why do I say that? Because one of the points I told them is they need to think deep and hard as to what is their value add. So what is it that they bring to the table as entrepreneurs when they are getting into a business? So don't just think, I have that particular company and all that. What differentiates that company? What is it? I know, for instance, a particular, and you know, we even did some role play, you know. Uh, so they come to you and they, they have the elevator speech, okay? You know the elevator speech, you have 30 seconds, 45 seconds to, to sell your company, your entrepreneur product, whatever it is. What is it that will remain with me when you sell that, you know? So, and, and it's interesting that they never really did that. They thought that just saying we are, you know, I'm, I'm in here to do a good thing, whatever it is, you know, cleaning up that, uh, building this, that that is sufficient. And I told them, you know, if you are in an elevator speech, in an elevator with me, at the end of the year, I'll give you my business card and tell you, thank you very much, you know, thank you very much, that's very interesting. And then I'll walk away and forget it. What I also told them is I'll give them the business card that I have in this pocket, not the one I have in this other pocket. This one doesn't have all the data, if you understand what I mean. And I think, well, I'm saying that because we in Kenya need to deal with it in that way. What is it that we are bringing to the East African community? It cannot just be, we are Kenya. You know, we, in a sense, think of even the way we have been challenged in the marathon. We are Kenya, right? It says that. I'm Kenyan. And so I have to be a good runner, right? And so I'm going to win this race. No, there's nothing that is farther from the truth than that, you know? I mean, in Boston, the Boston Marathon, I mean, the first three were Ethiopians for crying out loud, you know? And the, our poor Kenyans had to come back on Ethiopian Airlines. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's pathetic. So what is the value add? And I think that's where we need to sort of think uh, rather than uh, just uh, accept or believe that we are Kenyan, therefore we have value and all those other things. And that is value that will be recognized by others as well. You know, so what is it? Now, by the way, there are things that we are doing which are also very positive. Think of, for instance, the business, uh, the impact of the SGR on business. Today, today it takes, on a good sort of, uh, if you are lucky to take two days to move products from Mombasa to Nairobi, you know the numbers. On a bad week, it could even be more than a week. SGI, it will be four hours. So you can load things in the morning at the port, and in the evening, they're in your go-down in Nairobi. I mean, that is transformational. And the other things, one could talk about the other infrastructure, but it's not only about infrastructure, it's about people. So I think there is that. We, are, we have the best auditors in the place. We have the best accountants. I was going to say something about lawyers, but uh, maybe not. Uh, that would be too excessive, I think. But I think there are services, human services that we have, which maybe we kind of ignore. Um, and I think this is where we need to look and see what is the, what is it, what's the value add that we bring to the East African community. And to understand that trade is good. I'm an economist, so the idea of ataki doesn't make sense. We have to, you know, you go to the store and you see products, tomatoes from uh, Tanzania. Ah, oh, you know, what's the world coming to? Can't we grow our own tomatoes? Of course, we can grow on tomatoes, but maybe the Tanzanians are doing it better. So let's, let's accept that trade is good. Um, and I think we can, we can explain in what context we can talk about the theory. So I, I think we, we have something good going there, but we have to understand how to engage, not in the old fashioned sort of bully way, but uh, you know, what value do we bring? The saving the best for last, the issue of youth. For me, the issue of youth is fundamental to our country. We can change systems. Um, at the beginning, I was told that I have challenged the system and all that. That's, uh, I don't know, I would say, well, so be it. You know, let it go kind of thing, you know. Uh, but I think the point for us is, even as we change things, what we need to change is our mindset. 
and the ones <coughs> that need to change, to have a stronger, what's well, most pressing is with the youth. If the country, if the continent is to really rocket, it has to be the youth. And that's the issue of the aspirations that they have. When I dedicated the thing, you only get one little line that says, I dedicated to youth. But actually, the reason for that is so that they can be, they, they, it gives sort of meaning to their aspirations and uh, their dreams. I mean, really, they need to dream, 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 you know? And uh, so it, it's really sort of giving them something to shoot at. And I think they'll go for it. The biggest issue with youth, of course, is opportunities. Um, I can be more brutal on that one by saying that the biggest uh, inequities that we see uh, the world over is not about wealth. I know there's all these one percenters and nine, 99 percenters and all those other things. Oh, no, 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 nothing. The worst of all is about inequities in opportunities. So let's give our youth opportunities. And the way you give them those opportunities is to begin with opportunities <coughs> to grow their mind. Don't just give them, you know, keep them within a little confined little space. Oh, no, 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 their minds are phenomenal. Here we are talking about uh, cryptocurrencies and things like that. I mean, our youth should be well beyond that. I mean, why, and, and I think that's what we are trying to do. If we fire up our youth, the country will be completely transformed. I gave you a few things about transforming society, and, and this, I think, will be fundamental. We can do everything else right, but if, we, if our youth doesn't get transformed in this way, then we've lost it. Um, just in a little advertisement, if you may, um, as part of the CBK at 50 uh, celebrations, activities, we have put together a few things for the youth. For instance, we have, uh, we have uh, set up our internship. By the way, this is a major one, you know. Can you imagine, you know, little people walking around the central bank, you know. <laughs> just, just, just. Challenging you on monetary policy. Yeah, exactly, challenging me <laughs> on monetary policy. And, and the answer there is, yeah, precisely. That's what we want. We want people who, and then they'll have, they'll be there for six months, they'll, we are not gonna employ them, they'll go, but their aspirations will be transformed at the end of this. Um, but again, the point is, we, for six places, we got like 8,000 applications, 8,000. So you can see the, the youth are hungry uh, for, for something to aspire to. The other thing, of course, is the, um, well, with youth, we have, we also, on Tuesday, I'm supposed to be doing something with the Kenya School of Monetary Studies, uh, at the Kenya School of Monetary Studies, uh, with the youth of Madare. Um, I'm told they are anxious to talk about something, and I'm supposed to say something nice, whatever that nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm looking forward to that. I also, as part of the 50, 40th, uh, 50th, uh, when we launched our activity, we our this celebration, we had a bunch of youth from, that came and sang. Uh, the, uh, well, University of Nairobi, and uh, uh, youth choir, this, this. But the best of them all was uh, kids from the ABC Children's Home. Now, those are kids in Madare, by the way, or Madare North, as we say now, you know. MP for Madare North, you know, whatever. But in any event, they were little kids, and these kids had a great time with us. They, the best time, I think, was when they came to, the, to my office. And, you know, it was great, you know, seeing these kids having a great time there. Actually, one of the, the story that the DG tells is there was a little one that was lost, you know, and uh, found her, and, asked, and they were talking and said, gee, where are you going? I'm going to the governor's office. I said, oh, I'll take you there. I said, whose place is this? And the little kid says, mine. <laughs> That's the youth we are talking about, you know? Wow. Um, so a kid less than nine years old and understands that this is her institution. I mean, that's, you, you don't want to dampen that. You want to encourage that more than, so there are many things, but I think all of us are involved in, in those sort of youth activities and, uh, and that's how we are gonna transform the country.
I would like to say thank you to you, the Central Bank Governor, for what was a really engaging discussion. We're all really grateful for, for the fact that you came. There are not many central bankers, I think, in the world these days who can engage at this level, who can connect from all levels of society. And uh, we kindly, with some help from Gina and others, wanted to celebrate your award. And we have a giant cake here. And uh, we've got one little youth here who's 10. Um, who's going to, are you going to help the governor cut his cake, Hannah? Because I could see you were a youth who was getting a bit hungry for cake. <laughs> So congratulations. Thank you so much for coming today, Governor. Well, thank you very much for being here. By the way, the central bank governor, less than a year in office, got awarded last week in Lusaka by the African Development Bank, the central bank governor of the year. That's what we're celebrating. <laughs>